Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Spotlight on Jackson County. We are privileged and honored to have my friend Gene Taylor, Congressman, on our show today. Welcome to our show, Gene. Doug, great to I, be with you. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. No, thank you. And what Doug won't tell you about himself, he just told me he made 88 jumps when he was with the Airborne. With the uh, Rangers. <laughs> That's 88 times better than me because uh, I have to throw my dead body out of that airplane. Ah, uh, well. No big Very deal. Very impressive. Uh, Congressman, health care. You just had a town meeting in uh, Moss Point, got a little tenuous, I understand, at times, but uh, some of the people couldn't make it there, and uh, we, we've done a, a, a little promo, and some people have emailed their questions into sure. the station. And uh, if you don't mind, could we get no, started sure. with those? Well, let me, let me start by okay. saying that I do not favor the health care plan uh, that, that's out there. Um, and, and Doug, you and I, I'm, I'm guessing we're about the same age. Yes. You know, you go back to 1960, the only f people in America who were getting free health care or government paid for health care were either at a charity hospital if you were down on your luck, if you were serving in the military, or if you had served in the military, either through the VA health care system or through the military health care system. And back then, a lot of most military retirees lived very close to a base that they could use at base hospital. 60s come along, there's Medicare for people over 65, there's Medicaid for folks not making much money. And so, and, and that has grown to the point now where 46 cents out of every dollar, every healthcare dollar is government money right now. So we've got obligations to our veterans, we've got obligations to our military retirees. I have worked to expand health care. I led the fight for every guardsman and every reservist to have the ability to buy into TRICARE from the day they join, not just after a deployment, because we both know that if you're in the guard or the reserve now, you either have been to Iraq, you're going to Iraq, or you're just home from, you're at, in Iraq. Or you're about to go again. Or you're about to go again, as many of them have, or Afghanistan, fill in the blank. And, and so we have a lot of, ob that alone cost a billion a year to pass that. I also led the fight to see to it that every military retiree who served honorably for 20 years uh, led the fight for TRICARE for life. And so that we would keep that promise of lifetime health care to them. That's expensive, but again, it's a commitment our nation made. We have to keep it. So with a nation that's, as you pointed out, over $11 trillion in debt. It is mind-boggling. With a Medicare trust fund that will continue to collect enough in Medicare taxes to pay the Medicare bill on an annual basis until 2017. Come 2017, we'll no longer be collecting enough to pay the projected bills then. So we're already getting ready to hit a cliff on that one. We don't need to be making any new promises. What do we need to do? And we need to do a better job with the tax dollars that are already being collected, and I have three very specific ways to do that. Number one, I'm very, very fortunate to have on my congressional staff a guy who is an MBA, a chemist, and he came from the pharmaceutical industry. So he has walked me through how most new drugs, the ones you see advertised, are about that much better than a generic equivalent that's already on the market. But the difference in price is enormous. And I will use Ambien as an example, and these numbers came to me from a nice man who has a drugstore across my golf board office, the Triplet Day Drugstore. Ambien has been around for a while, so it is no longer uh, under the patent rule. So it's, it's considered a generic, and it's about 50 cents a tablet. But Ambien CR, the one you see advertised, the one where, where the ad ends, tell your doctor you want Ambien CR, about that much better cost almost six dollars a tablet. That's why they advertise to get you to say, I want the expensive stuff. Well, for what we buy as a nation, we ought to be buying generics whenever. And if an individual who's on Medicare or whatever wants to pay the difference for the high price stuff, or if their doctor says they have to have it, then we buy it. But if the doctor says generic's good enough, then it ought to be good enough for them. Hey, I'm a generic guy. I drive a Chevrolet. I'm not a fancy dresser. I'm a generic guy. Have no problem with generic drugs. Second thing we, we can do, and you talked about it, when they passed the prescription drug benefit bill back during the Bush years, and they kept that vote, if you remember, they kept that vote open for three hours while they twisted arms to get them to vote for it, middle of the night on November the 22nd. One of the provisions in there actually keeps our nation from using our enormous purchasing power as a nation to get a better price on drugs. Think about it, Walmart, 
uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, they, because their corporations are so big, when they go to buy something, they get the very best price because they're buying a lot of it. That's the way the world is. If you were to go down to a car dealer and buy 10 identical cars, you'd get a better price than a guy who's only going to buy one car. It's just Warren Goche here in Jackson County buys his shrimp by the truckload. He gets a better price than I do when I buy them by the pound. It's just the way it is. And so we ought to be using our purchasing power as a nation to get a better price. Interestingly enough, that provision was included by a guy named Billy Tozan, who started as a Democrat, became a Republican. Anyway, he puts this in the bill, leaves Congress, and takes a job as the head of the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. So you, we know where he was coming from. That language needs to come out. I have voted to remove it in the House. It didn't pass the Senate. We've got to do it again. And the third thing that, that helps drive the cost, all these things help drive the cost so all of these things can save us money. In 1946, the insurance industry was given a one-year exemption from the antitrust laws, the conflict of it, the laws that don't let one business call up another business, hey, let's raise prices, hey, let's, let's cut services. Every other business in America has to compete freely and openly. But these guys can legally call each other up, hey, let's raise prices, hey, let's cut coverage. Or you take Alabama, you take Florida, you take Mississippi. I won't compete with you, you don't compete with me. Perfectly legal and it shouldn't be. Only two industries in America are exempt from the antitrust laws. Major League Baseball, which I can live without, and insurance. <laughs> and by the way, my state tells me, it's not a bad decision, that if I want to ride on their roads, that I got to have automobile insurance. Yes. My nation tells me that if I have a mortgage and I live in a floodplain, that in order to get that mortgage, I have to have flood insurance. Again, not a bad law. So the, both the state and the nation tell me under some circumstances I got to have insurance, and yet the insurance I buy is not really open to competition. So I believe when we go back, those are three things that I really think we ought to be doing to stretch your dollars instead of spending more money, save us some money, and try to, try to move that target date of 2017 when Medicare is going to no longer collect enough to pay the bills Let's try to kick that out further in the future so that you know, we don't have to have a cut in Medicare benefits or an increase in Medicare taxes. Honestly, you think this, this uh, health care reform bill is going to pass? I do not. Uh, I've, I've certainly been surprised before, but given uh, the reaction around the country, I occasionally get home in time to watch the evening news, seeing the reaction around the country, I don't think it's going to pass, but again, I have been fooled before. If you would have asked me, geez, what... what uh, 15 years ago, if NAFTA would have become law, I would have said no way, and sure enough, we went back in that fall, they passed NAFTA. So, But I, I sure as heck hope it doesn't, and I don't think it will. I guess the other question I would have to ask would be, what's the hurry? Well, what, that's a great question. Why, why are we in such a hurry to do this? Doug, I'm not, not in a hurry. I know you're not, so, but I'm, I'm but, talking about the rest of yeah. the people in Washington just well, seem to be in such a big hurry to, to push I, this through. I it, think we're it not looking a, at the whole picture. Yeah, as somebody who's been lucky enough to do this for a while, I think it's a fair observation that every new president, Democratic or Republican, when they're first new, they've got some momentum. Some people got elected on their coattails, fair observation, whether they're Democratic or Republican. And so there tends to be some momentum that, hey, okay, he's the president, what does he want? Okay, I, we'll do it. Well, and I don't doubt for a minute that President Obama was trying to use the momentum of his election. And sure, some people, not down here, but some people in other parts of the country did get elected on his coattails, and so he was trying to get a lot done in a hurry. One of the things that I think the, the group that I belong to, the Blue Dogs, did that is been very beneficial is they were the ones who stopped this thing from going to a vote in July, gave people a chance to go home, cool off, listen to what the constituents back home had to say during August, and I think that five- or six-week delay is going to kill the bill. I sure hope it kills the bill. So do I. It, but let's get back to the debt. It, it's mind-boggling it when you look at it's scary. eleven trillion, two hundred and twenty-six billion, eight hundred and seven million, three hundred and eighty thousand nine hundred and fifty-five dollars. Oh, it's gotten bigger since you wrote that down. I just wrote it down today. I, it's, I guarantee it's gotten bigger since you wrote it down. And Doug, what, what is really troubling is a little over eight years ago, right now, the nation on an annual operating basis was in the black, slight surplus. The nation then had about a $5 trillion, $400 billion accumulated debt from the 200 plus years we've been a nation. And, and remember, 
there were guys like me saying, great, we're making some money, things are going good, let's pay down the debt. And you had guys like George Bush saying, and this is a direct quote, some economists are afraid we're paying off the debt too soon. I'm like, name one. Name one economist who thinks it's a good idea to stay in debt. And so I did not vote for the Bush budget. I, and you can go to the old speeches from, from the spring of 2001 where I said, guys, let's pay off the bills. We owe the Medicare trust fund money. We owe the Medicaid trust fund money. We have all these military retirees that have paid in with their lives and their sweat and years away from their families. We owe them their health care. We have enormous bills coming. We have an aging population. We have a diminishing ratio of workers to retirees. Let's do it now. Let's pay our bills while we can. And they didn't listen, and, and no one's madder about it than I am because we really did have a chance. There'll be other chances, but this time we'll be starting at 11 something instead of 5.4 trillion. That's that's thirty-six thousand six hundred eighty-three dollars per person. It is, believe me, I, I am I am aware of it. Unbelievable. And, and again, um, and I, you know, it really isn't said at the town meetings, but I think it's one of those things that people are thinking in the back of their minds that they are concerned about that because. Some of the certainty in people's lives is the fact that, yeah, that Medicare is there for me. That Social Security check is there for me. Or if you're less fortunate financially, that Medicaid is there for me. And they don't want to see that house of cards collapse by making too many new promises. And I don't want it either. I want that military retiree who served us for 20 years honorably to get his check every month, as he should, for the rest of his life. I want that military hospital to be there for him. I want that United States military that does such a magnificent job of protecting us. I want those guys to get paid first of the month and make sure that that check doesn't bounce and that that weapon we buy for them is the very best and that those things that we do to protect their lives, we still have the money to buy those things to protect them. And, and so you just, we just can't keep making new promises even if some of them sound like great ideas. And if had you attended the town meeting the other night, there was, a, you know, there was an OBGYN. It sounded to me like a, a great young man. He pointed out some things that need to be done, but that costs money. There were some other folks who talked about the inability to buy insurance if you have a pre-existing condition, and that's something we need to address, and, but this isn't the way to do it. And so let's tweak the system. Let's do it in a way that's cost effective, and let's just don't throw, in this case, $900 billion new dollars at a problem when we don't have those 900 billion every one of those dollars is going to have to be borrowed and so you know i'm not going to get into demagogue in this thing there are sincere people on both sides there are unfortunately some misstatements on both sides but it just comes down to the dollars and cents if i want to protect medicare if i want to protect medicaid which i do if i want to protect the va system which i do if i want to protect the military health care system which i do the way the best way to protect those things that we have right now is to make sure that we don't go broke and the best way not to go broke is not to make 900 billion dollar commitments of money that we don't have we're gonna have to take a short break sure. right there sorry about that pay the bills yes we got to pay the bills just like the country <laughs> we'll be right back with more after this welcome back to spotlight on jackson county with our very special guest congressman gene taylor gene uh, before uh you got here several days ago. We had a promo in the air, and we got some questions emailed to us from viewers, if uh, you don't mind. Uh, sure. Uh, this uh, first question is from Donald in Gauche, Mississippi. And well, I hope he, it is the great Don Gauche himself who survived the Batan Death March. But no, okay. I don't think it's him. But uh, uh, he has several questions. But uh, number one, do you favor and will you support medical liability or tort reform? When I was, most of that is done at the state level. When I was a state senator, I did vote for tort reform. There have been some issues up in Washington that I've also supported. But the truth of the matter is that the Mississippi legislature addressed that during the years when Ronnie Musgrove was, was governor. And I know a heck of a lot of doctors, and the vast, very, very few doctors still complain about tort reform. What we need to do now is insurance reform because we've, we've, we've fixed one side of that equation, but as long as the insurance companies are free to like I said, call each other up and raise prices, call each other up and cut coverages, call each other up and say, hey, you take this business, I'll take that business, I don't want any competition. We've got, that's got to change because that really will affect the bottom line and it really will save people money. Will that change be a federal level? It would have, it would have to be, at the, they were given that exemption from the antitrust laws at the federal level. They, that exemption has to be taken away at the federal level. And I'm assuming that there's a tremendous lobby and they spent, the off the top of my head, about $25 million, the insurance industry, cumulatively, 
on the last cycle elections for president, for congressmen, for senators. And remember, we, we were able to get a package through the House that would allow people to buy wind insurance, uh, hurricane insurance, as an option to their flood insurance so that no matter what happened in the course of a storm, you pay your, you build your house the way you're supposed to, you pay your premiums. Doesn't matter if the wind did it, the water did it, you get paid. You don't have to hire a lawyer, you don't have to hire an attorney. Passed it through the House, it went to the Senate, and quite honestly, the insurance lobby beat us over in the Senate. Senator Cochran voted with us, uh, Senator Wicker voted with us, but we didn't have the 50 votes that we needed, and they're fighting us every day. Yeah, I can right bet now. you they weren't in your office trying to lobby you. No. <laughs> okay, Don, I'll ask another question. Do you favor and will you support removing federal rules which restrict buying health insurance across state lines? Uh, to the, uh, to the, sir, to the absolute best of my knowledge, there is zero federal regulation of insurance. To the best of my knowledge, the only thing where the federal government gets involved in insurance is they did agree to a provision that the banking industry wanted that said if you have a mortgage and you live in a floodplain, that you have to have enough federal flood insurance to cover that mortgage. But other than that, there is zero federal regulation of insurance. So what we have is a hodgepodge of 50 different sets of rules. And for most people, it's no big deal. But you know, for those folks who may have a house here and a summer place in Alabama or a camp in Louisiana, then they suddenly discover, wait a minute, I've got to live by all these different rules. And, uh, this policy is reasonably priced, this policy is obscenely high. Well, that's because we have 50 different sets of rules because there is zero federal regulation of insurance with that one exception. One more from Donald. Do you favor and would you support medical savings accounts coupled with the option to purchase catastrophic coverage? Yes. Uh, again, as you pointed out, the nation is $11 trillion in debt. We would have to see what the effect would be on the deficit because that what he basically is asking for is to be able to take some money, pre-tax dollars, set them aside for a medical savings account. Uh, so, so again, if it does not have a significant impact on the deficit, sure. But it's, it's still it, pre-tax dollars, so it's going to cost the government. Right. So we've got to see what it, what it actually translates to, because if it turns around and costs Medicare or Medicaid less, then it may break even. And that's why we have to look at the whole equation. All right, well, let's, let's do some shifting in the gears here. Uh, Anne from Gaucher, uh says, will you be asked, will you be talked into voting in favor of cap and trade? Cap and in trade other words, is, can anybody influence no, you to do cap that? Cap and trade has already come before the House. I voted against it, and I thought it was a Ponzi scheme. If it, and, and I know this is a very big simplification, but it basically said that a smokestack somewhere in America is going to be cleaner than it has to be, so that another smokestack somewhere else in America can be dirtier than it should be. <laughs> and that the same guys who manipulated the price of gasoline to over $4 a gallon last summer on the over-the-counter traders can trade these credits, the credit from the guy who's got a factory that's too clean that he can sell to the guy for the factory, well, I'm sorry, the smokestack that's too dirty. Those guys, the over-the-counter traders, are going to trade these. Of course, there's a cost associated with all this is, that is passed on to the people who buy fuel, and that that's somehow good for the average American is nuts, because, and quite frankly, there's a second part of it. Historically, that smokestack that is cleaner than it has to be is usually in California. That smokestack that is historically is dirtier than it should be is usually in the Deep South. So they get the credits, and somewhat we get the carcinogens. And remember, if it goes in the air, it can go in any direction. It can go very far. So for a lot of reasons, there ought to just be a federal standard. They ought to make sense. They ought to, be, they ought to grow up incrementally and show where the benefit to people's health is worth if there's any additional cost. And do it as technology comes along rather than trying to push the envelope with a whole bunch of federal tax dollars. Which would cause everything to go up. Right. Okay, Fred from Pascagoula. It's a very long question, so I'm going to try to, to kind of uh, condense it a little bit. Uh, he's, he's basically saying that he doesn't want government to in, intrude in his life, and his question uh, to you is, will you stand up and before the House and say enough is enough, and you represent the wishes of the constituents and the American people, and you don't represent the party which wishes to stop the madness. The health care bill is not good for America. Okay. It should be stopped. Well, I would remind Honestly, Fred, he, he mentions that he's a lifelong resident of this county, that if he ever worked at Chevron, or as a friend who works at Chevron, the reason that, that refinery is there is because of that federally maintained channel 
that was dug by the federal government is maintained by the federal government. And if it ever silted in, in all honesty, that refinery would probably go away. Same thing for Northrop Grumman. I think the water here naturally would probably be 10 feet deep at best. You can't build a warship that draws 20 something feet and take it out if you don't have a federally maintained channel. Um, let's face it, if you work at Northrop Grumman and 10,000 people do, they only have one customer, that's Uncle Sam. Uh, heck, a lot of people in the western side of Jackson County live there so they can live close to Keesler Air Force Base so that they can use the medical benefits that they earned while they were in the service again, but it is a part of our government. And it's also a huge employer down that way. We have, this, they have the hurricane hunters flying overhead right now. Exactly. Give us some warning should a storm be coming. We have satellites that our nation put in space, again, to give us some warning. So uh, I, I just ask people to think this through when they say no government. No, I love my government. Our nation is very good to us. Are we as, as efficient as we should be every time? Absolutely not. And we need to be as efficient as we can. And then there's some things that government does better than the private sector. Yeah. How about after the hurricane when it came to insurance claims? I did not have one complaint on federal flood insurance. Everybody got paid their federal flood claim that I know of. It, but in, on the other hand, on the case of wind insurance, we had thousands of complaints. That was the private sector. So one of the things that we're trying to do right now is let people buy wind insurance, again, through their federal flood plan, and, and cut out the conflict of interest that exists right now where we let the private sector sell that flood policy. That's, that's not really a problem. But when we let them adjust the claim, and they're working for State Farm, all state nationwide, and they walk out and they go, gee, did the wind do it, which means my company's got to pay? Or did the water do it, which means the taxpayer's going to pay? I think they had a huge incentive to say, the water did it. In fact, you, you saw my website, and I would encourage yes, people to go to it. A lawyer for Nationwide Insurance Company was asked by Justice Pierce of the Mississippi Supreme Court if after multiple hours of hurricane force winds, a house is 90% destroyed by the wind, and then the water comes along and destroys the last 10 percent. How much do you, Nationwide Insurance, pay? And his answer under oath was not one dime. So you know who got stuck with that bill? That meant that adjuster went to that property, blamed it all on the flood, which meant the taxpayers paid the bill that Nationwide should have at least paid 90 cents on the dollar out of. And so, so you know, I'm just asking people, let's think this through. Our nation does some things very well. Air traffic control comes Definitely. to mind. The levees along the Mississippi River, okay, they failed one time in 80 years. Well, that still means 80 years they did a great job of keeping that city that people call New Orleans from going underwater. Uh, protecting us, they do a great job. So there are a lot of things our nation does well. We just need to see to it that everything our nation does, we do very effectively. I think they're just scared that this, that this is going so well, fast and, no, and you're it's right, going to cost so much money and they just want everybody it's, to slow right. down, sure. think it through. Uh, not make a hasty decision, right. look at it, read the bill in some right. cases. Some of them admitted that right. didn't read the bill. And I was, you know, it's just something very big. No, it Doug, weighs you, more you, than you, the you King a, James Version of the Bible, for God's sake. You make sake. a great point, and again, I'm, I take great pride in that the group that I hang with, called the Blue Dog Democrats, are the ones that, that delayed this vote for the five weeks so that folks back home would get a chance to tell their congressmen and their senators their concerns, whether they're for the bill or against it, they got a chance to meet with their senators, their congressmen, let them know how they feel, or email them, or write them. Or, um, I think on a typical week, we answer about 1,000 letters, phone calls, and emails. And so I'm, I, that's probably typical around the country. So that's a lot of mail. That's a lot of phone calls. Well, one thing I got to say about Eugene is that you have regular town meetings. You, we, had, you have regular scheduled town meetings long before any of these other people no, ever doing started this. having them. So that's, that's a credit to you. I've been doing you, this for You're 20 going years. out and you're finding out. I, other, like, unlike some of the other congressmen and, and senators, you go out into the community, you find out what the heartbeat of these, these constituents are, and you listen to them. Most of these other people haven't been doing that, and I think well, that's where, where the problem really yeah. exists. It, and I think that's fair to say. I, I don't know that, uh, that either of our senators have had a town meeting in South Mississippi this year. Uh, I've had two a month, so that two times eight, eighth month, 16 town meetings. We've had three right here in Jackson County, uh, Ocean Springs, Goche, and, ju and just the other night in Moss Point. So, again, we can't get everywhere at once. I represent 15 counties. It takes a while to get around, but we've had quite a few. Well, well that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. You've been doing this even before the health care debate started. No, it wouldn't be January if I didn't have a town meeting <laughs> in Ocean Springs. So we, you can set your watch by it. 
One more, me one more question uh, from Austin and Moss Point. If your constituents were not in favor of a bill, would you vote against their wishes if you favored the bill? What are, Austin, the approach that I have taken for all these years is that I am doing what I think a majority of South Mississippians would do if they had the access to the information that I do, which, it's, which in many instances is classified, and the time to sift through it and then think about the implications on things like the debt, keep in mind our declining ratio of workers to retirees, what's it going to do to us 10 years from now? And I think, and I think the fact that uh, I very fortunately got more votes than any of the presidential candidates, any of the senators last fall, I think, uh, I think people appreciate that. We've got about 30 seconds, okay. Gina. It's, uh, the show's almost over. Any uh, thoughts you want to leave them? Go to the GI Museum. Ah! <laughs> it is, it's, it's a great thing, and, and Doug's a great friend, and again, it, he's just one of the many, uh, many patriots well, we have living down here in South I, Mississippi. I, I am humbled by your comments, but uh, I also want to say we are indeed fortunate in Jackson County and South Mississippi to have a man of this caliber representing us in Washington who has all the town meetings, who goes and fights for us on a daily basis, and he's never home to see his family, I assure you, because I've kept him here late today doing this show for you. Congressman Taylor, Doug, again, it's so great to see great you. Thanks to see for you. being here. Thanks, and thanks, thanks for you. your son service. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you for watching this special edition of Spotlight on Jackson County. Join us again next week for more. That's a wrap.